good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Australia Founders Succeeding in the U.S. Market webinar. Now, I have the privilege of introducing for welcoming remarks, Council General David Gaynor. Welcome, David. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Linda, and good morning to everyone who is dialing in here in Australia. And good evening to those of you tuning in from the United States. It's really uh, a great pleasure to have over 120 businesses on the call today. Uh, and welcome to this online event run by the U.S. Commercial Service in Australia. Australian companies of all sizes are increasingly eyeing expansion into the U.S. market. Thanks in part to our free trade agreement and buoyed by the size of the market, the access to abundant skilled labor pools, and the similarity between the two countries' business cultures. The United States remains by far the largest destination for Australian overseas capital. And at any time, over 240,000 Australians are living in the US. Today, we will hear from leading Australian entrepreneurs, Deb Noller from Switch Automation, Wayne Gerard from Red Eye Apps, and Emma Weston from AgriDigital. I look forward to them sharing their story and their secrets to success in the US market. They are shining examples of Australian companies succeeding in the United States. Their businesses have expanded from San Francisco to Denver to Houston and to Colorado. Now, before we pass over to senior associate from Bond Partners, uh, Joanna Oliveira, uh, our commercial specialist, Georgie Harwell, will update you on Select USA. Thank you. Georgie, it's over to you. Thank you, Consul General Gaynor. My name is Georgie Harrowell, and together with my colleagues Duncan Archibald in Sydney and Seth Eisenberg in DC, we help Australian companies set up in the United States via Select USA. Select USA is the US government foreign direct investment promotion agency. So we provide Australian companies with research on US industry cluster trends, counselling and connections to the federal, state and city government officials and agencies in the United States. While we offer these services all year round, we have an exciting program called Select USA uh, Summit coming up from 7th to the 11th of June. Registrations are now open. It's hosted by the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Romando, and the summit will feature uh, keynote addresses and breakout sessions covering every aspect of, of expanding to the North American market, ranging from taxation insights to identifying talent, protecting IP and more. And again, the state level economic development uh, organisations will be on hand if you have any questions. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, Georgie, and thank you everyone for joining us today on this webinar. I'm so excited that you could make it and I really appreciate your time. My name is Joanna Oliveira, and I'm really excited to be your moderator for today's event. I'm a senior associate at Bondi Partners. We are a strategic advisory firm helping Australian companies heading over to the US and the US companies heading over to Australia. We have a number of different experts that help companies achieve their goals, including our founding president, Joe Hockey. We have an incredible lineup of speakers today. As, as you heard, we have Deb Nola, CEO of Switch Automation. We have Emma Weston, uh, the CEO of, uh, of AgriDigital, and Wayne Gerard, CEO of Red Eye. So we have um, some incredible experience of Aussie, leading Aussie tech companies who've headed over to the US market. So I'd like to start with our panelists, bring them on online. And if you could each please give an introduction of yourself and of your business, um, we can start there. Thanks, Joanna, and pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, and good evening for some as well, uh, which is fantastic. So my name is Emma Weston, and I'm the CEO and a co-founder at AgriDigital. And AgriDigital is a ag tech company working in the grain supply chain. Uh, we basically digitize, automate, and organize global grain inventories, um, and also pr provide supply chain finance. Um, so it's basically a combination of tech and finance. We started here in Australia. Um, and launched recently in the US as well. So really pleased to be here and to be sharing our journey. Hi everyone, I'm Deb Noller. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Switch Automation. We build technology for portfolios of buildings that are transitioning to a digital and low carbon future. Uh, our company is now headquartered in Denver, Colorado. 
We have around 60 on our team globally. Um, we are, I'm currently in Singapore. We're expanding at the moment into Southeast Asia and we're about to launch our Series B. Uh, most of our clients are North America, so Canada and uh, US, uh, and most of our customers are large commercial real estate portfolios. G'day everyone, my name is Wayne Girard. Great to be here and uh, great to have a chat with you all. I, we're a software as a service company that helps large complex assets or critical infrastructure to better access and manage their engineering and asset information. Founded the company with a good mate of mine in 2012. And in 2014, I moved to North America to see if we had a solution that was relevant in the North American market. We established in Houston in 2014. Today, I have uh, roughly 75 people. We have three offices in uh, North America, including Houston, Denver, and Las Vegas. We're lucky enough to have some great customers over there. We just won the city of Seattle, for example. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here. And I look forward to sharing some of the lessons I've learned, uh, some of the challenges I've faced. I've faced many and uh, hopefully helping you guys to uh, you know, learn from us rather than making the same mistakes we've made. Cheers. Thank you all. Thank you all for that introduction. And like I said at the, at the top, this you know we're really lucky to have um, you three to be able to share your experiences. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge on this panel uh, with, with you three, so I'm really happy that you could you could join us. Now I want to start by understanding a bit more about the opportunities of the U.S. market. Now you've all um, done done work and expanded there. Um, Wayne, I might start with you. Could you tell us a little bit more about your thinking around? Um, the initial expansion to the US and how that's unfolded. Yeah, thanks, Joanna. We, when we started Red Eye in 2012, we started in the mining industry. Pretty soon after, uh, we, we secured some clients in oil and gas. Obviously, the North American oil and gas industry is the leading oil and gas industry. And so we wanted to see if we were relevant in that market, also in mining. We decided to move to North America in 2014 to demonstrate that we could build a tech company here in Australia, in Brisbane, that was relevant globally. And so we were kind of thinking that born global uh, kind of approach from day one. And I basically picked up and headed to North America and started to, you know, meet, meet potential customers, really leverage the Australian network in North, North America and try and understand if Red Eye was relevant it was quite a journey for us to uh, to get going. We were a very tiny company at that stage. Uh, you know, hadn't raised, in fact, we, yeah, we hadn't raised any money at that stage. We were still um, very tiny. And over the years, it's, uh, you know, we learned a lot of lessons. We, we had a false start. You know, we started in the oil and gas industry in 2014. The market uh, tanked about six months after we got there. So we grew to 11 people. And what we realized was that our solutions were relevant in lots of industries, not just mining oil and gas. Uh, we secured some water, some power and healthcare clients as well in North America. And um, yeah, that helped us to expand to have a couple of offices that we have now. Great, thank you. And and Deb, I'll, I'll go to you now. Could you share a little bit more about your story, that first entry into the US and, and how you've expanded? Yeah, very similar actually to uh, Wayne's story. So we also went to the US around that time. So our platform launched in 2012, but in exactly the same way that Wayne was thinking, we wanted to be a global company, a global technology company from day one. So we were building for the world of buildings, because if you look at buildings and the way they're managed, they look like 1990. So we initially went to Singapore for a a few months and realized that our tech was far too early for the Singapore market. So we went to the US. Uh, at that time, we hadn't raised any money. I think we were five or six people in our team and two of us went to the US. Um, and everybody tries to actually discourage you from going to the US. They tell you all the reasons why you're gonna be unsuccessful in the US. So it's it's a huge market, it's not one market, it's seven, blah, blah. So you, you go there with a sense of terror really because you everyone's kind of telling you before you even leave Australia that you're going to fail. 
But what I actually found, and that, so consequently for the first year, I felt that we were too small to be selling into the US market. So we spent the whole of that first year going up and down the West Coast, talking to everybody who was providing services to buildings to see if they would adopt our tech. So we were trying to find a channel first. Um, and I call that the year that I tried to sell Uber to taxi drivers. It's if, if a business is already making money, they have a successful business model, they've invested in that business, they and they get up every morning and nobody's eating their lunch, they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. And you, you turn up and try and sell them something better, cheaper, faster, and they're not interested. So we then, I think our first client that we won was actually Wells Fargo. So it was like, if we can sell to Wells Fargo, we can sell to anybody. And I realized that we actually had to sell direct first to demonstrate to the channel that we had something that was tangible. The hardest thing is that first customer. And nobody in the US, and in fact, Singapore is very similar. No one cares what you've done in other markets. It's completely dis disregarded. They only care about what customers you have in their market. So that first customer is absolutely critical. That's right. That's right, Deb. And Emma, could you share a little bit more about your entry into the US? You know, the same but different. Uh, we're a little bit younger um, than, than Deb and Wayne in terms of AgriDigital. Um, so AgriDigital was founded in 2015. Um, the, the, the kind of the potted journey um, that took us to the US was, uh, you know, like Wayne said, we, we knew straight away that um, we had to be born global. Um, you know, that was the idea. I mean, and that's more of an aspiration than a reality, let's be honest. Um, but, you know, the market in Australia for um, ag tech is too small to support um, a venture funded business in particular. So if you have global ambitions, I think you have to build out, you know, with that mindset. So we, we did do that, um, but what actually took us to the US in reality was we won a competition. So like a lot of tech startups, we, we won a, um, a hackathon, which at the time was a blockchain hackathon. Um, and that was very much the, you know, the vogue and it's kind of having a, a you know, obviously a, a second wave at the moment. Um, and that took us to the, the first prize was to go to Finnovate, um, which was the, the world's largest um, financial services conference. And that was held in New York. And so we kind of went eyes wide open, um, you know, three founders and employee number one. I think that's all we had at the time. Um, designers and engineers from other companies um, to, you know, to, to kind of get tech out there um, and very quickly realized it, it, it is big. It is bold. Um, and we were way, way, way too early um, for that market. So, you know, we, we went back to Australia to what we knew. We have very extensive. So I'm a farmer and my two co-founders are farmers as well. We've worked in the grains industry for a very long time. So we had very, very good networks here. And we realized what we needed to do was build a base in Australia first. Um, and although what Deb has said is absolutely correct, no one actually cares about that in the US once you get there. Um, it actually helped us, you know, define and refine our product and our strategy and to work out um, how to actually go about market entry into the US. And what we decided to do was have quite a long discovery phase. And so we were very lucky to be supported by Austrade um, with the, the, the landing pad, um, landed in San Francisco. That was myself. Um, so, you know, I was the kind of the one of the three founders that went across um, and, you know, was just on a pure discovery mission. Um, you know, for, for listeners who were interested, the North American market being USA and Canada combined, the grains industry, the market's 12 and a half times the size of the Australian market. So it is very large and kind of impenetrable. Um, you know, the Midwest is big. Um, the, the prairies in Canada, they're big. Uh, you know, we think Australia is big, but uh, America's, you know, really big. So it did, it was difficult in that first three months um, to be trying to find customers, um, basically. And that's what I was there to do. I wasn't there to find investment. We had recently raised in Australia. I was there to really find um, early adopter customers um, and to learn as much as we could. So we spent about 12 months in that learning and discovery phase um, and then built out our confidence and our capacity to be able to go to trade shows, conferences, events, you know, that were relevant to our target customer who are farmers in the United States. Um, and, you know, finally got those first few early adopter customers who have been amazing because, um, you know, like put a camera in front of them and they'll just jump. They just love to be on video. So, um, you know, they love telling everybody about Waypath and, and how it's been fantastic, um, you know, for their business. And that has then kind of helped the ball get rolling for us. 
So, you know, that was the kind of the good part. The difficult part um, was COVID and maybe we're going to crack into that at a, at a later date. So I won't kind of um, talk about that now, but there's definitely been some ups and downs on the journey. Thanks, Emma. And I'll, I'll stay with you for a moment just to touch on now about sort of the partners and clients. And, you know, you've, you've spoken about that first entry point into the market can be the, the toughest. Um, could you share a little bit more about, you know, how you prove that sort of that case study coming from Australia into the US? I know you've touched on it a little bit so far, but share a little bit more about, you know, how you prove that to, you know, US customers without, you know, having that initial traction in market. And, and now you, you've built a, a great um, range of, of customers in the US. So, yeah, what advice do you have? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that I cottoned on to um, early and, you know, the landing pad was formative for this was that there is a very deep and abiding respect for founders and for the entrepreneurial spirit in the US. And so, you know, we found in our case that there were customers who uh, really wanted to just give us a go and to support, and, and they respected the fact that I was out there beating the pavement, if you like, or, you know, driving down driveways and turning up to trade shows and you know, that that did have credibility for our market. Um, and, you know, the although the market didn't care as much what we had done in Australia, the turning up and, you know, the being there and the commitment was meaningful combined with the founder ethic um, and the, the respect for, you know, entrepreneurialism in the US. So I think that was very useful. Uh, then, you know, I had to dig in and kind of release my inner American, right? I, you know, I had to say that we're good at what we do. We are not just good at what we do. We are the best at what we do. You know, we have a big vision. We are changing. We are transforming. And I couldn't, you know, be too Australian about that, to be frank. Um, you know, I really kind of had to, um, I, I, I'm being very honest, I um, modified my accent somewhat to make it easier for me to be understood, particularly in the Midwest. I was shameless in asking for referrals and references. And if you like us, then you know someone else who does. Tell me who that person is. Would you put a good word in? You know, would you send an email or, you know, can I quote you? Would you take a call if someone asked for a reference? You know, all of these, I'd never asked for any of that. You know, and I'd probably been able to depend upon personal networks in Australia, but I didn't have that depth of participation. And so, you know, everything had to be done at an accelerated pace with no shame, you know, and, and lots of game. Yeah. yeah. Emma, I think you, you raised some fantastic points there and some really great advice for um, the founders online today about how they can that's, use that advice when they're looking at the U.S. market. I agree with you. You know, it's that there's I think there's an underappreciation for how different the business culture is and, you know, making that um, introduction to potential customers or, or partners is something that founders should definitely consider in elevating what they do um, to the to the level that, you know, that, that they truly are at. So, you know, I always say to, to founders, you know, when they're explaining that technology or who they are, it's not showing off. It's just taking that opportunity to explain themselves. And sometimes as Aussies, perhaps we, you know, like to have more of that, you know, humble attitude. And, and, and Deb, you know, do you have any reflections on that in terms of, you know, building out your business in the US? And Yeah, I love listening to that because it's so true. You know, <clears throat> Australians don't typically like to brag and they don't like people that do brag, but you've got to learn how to how to own the space and stand up and be noticed. Otherwise, somebody will literally suck the oxygen out of the room and take your business. Um, so you you do have to do that. I, I think the other thing that I would add is uh, Americans are naturally suspicious of um, startups not being able to go the distance. And then because you're coming from Australia, you've got one other um, one other risk against your name. So the first customer is really important. And to Emma's point, you want somebody who will give you those references and, and uh, a case study, a published case study. You, you need that kind of, um, that stamp of uh, authority to be there. But also um, I found hiring my first American was, that was a game changer for me because all of a sudden, we were real because we were hiring a lot. We, we'd hired a local person. So my advice would be hire a local person who 
has the best brand, personal brand in your market, um, don't just hire a junior. Hire the most expensive person that you can that, that has the most reach. And so I actually hired somebody who did have a lot of connections. He had a Harvard MBA. Uh, he did have that um, complete and utter attitude where he could just, you know, talk. And also he was able to listen to the nuances that I wasn't hearing. So I would be hearing, oh, these people like us. They want us to have another coffee. They, they're, they're happy to go for another meeting. And he'd go, what are you talking about? They're wasting your time. And so he was able to cut through that business, uh, especially in California. Everyone's nice, you know. That's right. And and Wayne, um, what's been your experience, with, you know, with um, expanding in the US and how, you know, you've managed to build out such an incredible um portfolio of, of customers, clients and partners? It's it's hard work is the, the first thing. Uh, we've been at it now since 2014. We've, we hired a really, really go, good guy after we did our Series B in uh, November 18. And, you know, really experienced person, just, just um, exactly like Deb was saying. And that's made a huge difference. You've got to be prepared to invest a lot of money uh, to to really scale in North America. I will say something about Australian networks in North America. Select USA firstly was a great program. I, I was lucky enough to go there with Duncan and Georgie in 2017. That really was helpful in terms of getting a sense of the scale of the North American market and the opportunities to enter uh, you know different states and and what what advantages there were for where to locate. Uh, what grants and funding sources were available, and you know how how helpful the different state and local governments would be to you know attract uh, attract a startup to help you find talent to help you get introductions into those markets. So I really do encourage people who are thinking about launching in North America to have a chat to Georgie and Duncan about Select USA. It is a good program. Uh, the second thing I'd say is there's a really strong Australian network over there. There's the Australian American Chamber of Commerce and there's Advance as well. Great, great networks, great people, and really, really helped me to establish some early relationships. I think back to 2013, which was the first time I went to North America. There were, you know, back then startups, you know, the startup scene in Australia was very small. Um, and there really wasn't a lot of people that had trod the path before us. So, you know, I went to North America in 2013 to go to a mining conference and ended up uh, visiting the uh, Australian consulate in San Francisco. And, you know, I was asked, do you have a pitch deck? And I'm like, well, what's a pitch deck? You know, I'd never even heard of one back then. And luckily, I got introduced to some great people who helped me to make some introductions to the venture community and learn about pitch decks. And I built a pitch deck and started to, you know, meet various investors on Sand Hill Road and and you know I've trod that path now many, many times up and down Sand Hill Road and in New York and in LA and in Houston and uh, you know all over the place really, uh, DC as well. Uh, so raising money in North America is also a, a really good milestone for an organization getting attracting US investors. So for us, we secured a range of US clients. For example, we manage you know, all the engineering data for Hoover Dam, and that was quite a large feather in our cap and really gave us credibility in the market. Right? It demonstrated that we could address all the security requirements, that we had a solution that was relevant to, you know, to large complex water utilities in North America. And that then helped us to attract US investors. We attended stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of trade shows. Yeah. Um, me as a founder, I traveled to the US pretty much every year prior to COVID five times a year, and I'd spend three weeks a trip there. And I'd spend three weeks because it you know, costs so much money and takes so long to get there, I wanted to make the most of it. And so I was trying to run the business between Australia and North America. Very grateful to have hired a, a great US uh, leader. And now we have a number of US staff on board. We still have some Australians that we moved over there. So in 2017, we moved a couple of Australians to North America. 
And that worked really well as well. The people that have moved over because it's given them enormous opportunities, right? And so they've developed skills and additional market capabilities that they've brought back now to Australia. So some have stayed, some have moved back. I, the other thing I'd say is building relationships with uh, the US consulate in Australia is, has been really, really helpful. And uh, they have been incredibly uh, supportive of not just Red Eye, a number of, of companies helping us with introductions, providing advice. Uh, the Consul General's uh, also been very, very supportive. So there's a lot of things that I think you, you need to do beyond just, um, beyond just selling, you know, establishing relationships, establishing networks, you know, uh, turning up. Um, and I think both the ladies said that so well, like Emma, you know, turning up and just demonstrating you're committed to the market, you're putting people there. That stuff's helped really well. Some of the challenges we faced, like getting our team credit cards, uh, the Australians that moved over, you know, helping them set up bank accounts, helping them buy cars, stuff like that. All that stuff is uh, becomes a distraction from growing a business. And so learning how to do that and uh, working out how to overcome those things is you know, really worthwhile. That's right. Thank you, Wayne. Some, some great advice there. And if I can uh, stay with you for a moment, uh, I, I want to ask you about you know, you've touched on raising capital in the US and then also building out the business. One thing that's really stood out to me after spending a few years in the US is, you know, one of the first um, sort of, you know, landing spots uh, for Aussie tech companies is San Francisco. And San Francisco will and, and the Valley will, you know, always have a key place in terms of um, fundraising in the US market. I'm interested to know how you uh, balance that um, with your expansion into other parts of the US, such as um, Colorado, Nevada, and Texas, where you, you know you, you might not necessarily have to be based in the Valley to be able to do business. To, and could you talk a little bit about that? And then we'll we'll pass to Deb and Emma to get your experience too, because I know you, Deb, you've got some fantastic experience in in Colorado, and Emma, your knowledge of the Midwest and experience there is also fantastic. So yeah, I'd love to touch on. Yeah, outside of, you know, the traditional places where founders might be looking at. San Francisco is amazing and the Bay Area more broadly, Palo Alto, that whole, that, that whole stretch is so filled with entrepreneurial energy and spirit. It is really, really attractive. It is also incredibly competitive, incredibly expensive and very, very hard to stand out. Right. None, re realistically, very few of my clients are based in San Francisco or the Bay Area. Most of my clients are everywhere else. And for Red Eye, it made sense to go where our clients were. We really focused on winning business and we wanted to set up and be local to our clients. You know, uh, those first handful, five, 10 clients that you can over service and really build into referenceable clients they're the ones that give you that reach to the next five to 10. And so we opened up in Houston, we opened up in, um, in Denver, we opened up in Vegas, because that's where our clients were. We've got plans to expand to the East Coast right now. And again, that's really off the back of, of winning opportunities. And so it, for us, our kind of motto is be pulled into a new area by clients. Right. So we've we've raised venture funding and the the uh, investor that we raised from has offices in San Fran and Houston, which was really beneficial for us. Uh, they're plugged into the oil and gas industry. They're plugged into the venture tech community. So really, really powerful. Um, we're also winning work in Alaska and Canada. And so for us as um, as an organization, we've you know, travel is really, really important. Uh, Working out where the hubs are and positioning ourselves around travel hubs has also been a really simple thing. Um, well, sorry, not so much simple. It's simple if you're an American to understand how the travel network works. Uh, as an Australian, unless you're going there all the time, travel and positioning yourself around travel hubs is a really, really important part of you know how we, it, it's helped us enormously to be more flexible, to be more responsive to our clients. So, Little things like that, really powerful. Clients definitely want to be able to uh, reach out and talk to a person face to face. That's been our experience. That's right. And Deb, can I pass to you for your reflections on that? 
Yeah, so when I first went to the US, I had no idea where to base myself, but my first two flights into the US, I spent five hours and 10 hours respectively in Los Angeles airport, which, which at that time had no internet. I, I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to be able to get off the plane and go straight to work. So that at that time, that meant Dallas, Los Angeles or San Francisco. I didn't want to get on another flight. So for the first four years, I based myself in San Francisco because I knew I would be doing capital raising and I knew that if you're going to be capital raising, you might as well be in San Francisco. I think the really important thing for everybody on the call to realize is that San Francisco has a very specific niche in the in the startup space. So there are uh, funders, uh, you know, and VCs and private equity and growth equity, there's companies all across the US that will fund companies. The ones that are in San Francisco are uh, highly sort of specialized around consumer tech and high growth. You know, if you think about Twitter and Facebook and things like that, and, and you know, Wayne and Emma and myself are, are all in enterprise tech. Uh, and so, and GovTech and AgTech. And so you're actually not gonna find too many of the funders there. So I found San Francisco absolutely fantastic for learning from other founders. So what Wayne said is absolutely true. It's just full of people that are having a crack and some of them are, and they're all on different stages and they're in their journey. And so you're just learning so much from other founders. It's like an immersive entrepreneurial course, just basing yourself in San Francisco and going to every meetup. And people are very generous. But I very quickly realized San Francisco was not the city for Switch because one, the talent that we were hiring was not software engineers. Our software is all developed out of Australia. I needed to hire energy engineers and mechanical engineers and data scientists. And so, and also the people in San Francisco don't care about the efficiency of their, their buildings. They care about whether they've got the most amazing cool chef that's gonna change the menu every day for their, for their precious team. So they, they didn't care about the kinds of things that our tech was addressing. So we had neither customers nor funding partners nor um, uh, team uh, potential out of San Francisco. So we moved to Denver for the, exactly the same reason that Wayne was alluding to, middle of the country. So you can, and it's a major airline hub for United. So you can get cheap flights everywhere and you're no more than three hours to anywhere else in the US. It's also an international airport. So you can fly to London or Munich or Iceland from, from Denver. The Aussie, Network is pretty strong in uh, Denver. Zero has their headquarters there and they have a pretty strong consulate uh, representative. It's not actually a consulate office, but they do have a, a consulate rep there. And so there's a lot of Australian events. They're lobbying hard to get direct flights from um, Australia into Denver. And so that was actually why we re-headquartered our company into Denver. And actually we're now a US headquartered company out of Denver mainly um, in order to attract the funding. Great. And Emma, what about you and, and you, your experience in the Midwest? Yeah, so um, obviously we're a little bit earlier stage, um, but from where, where we are at the moment, we, I guess I just want to pick up on a couple of points that is, this is actually, it's been great to be on the panel, but I would have been happy to have been in the audience. Um, there's, there's so many um, kind of pearls that have been, and, and just like little recognition points where I'm going, oh, that happened to me too, or, um, you know, note to self. Um, so, you know, so this is fantastic. But um, I guess the first point to pick up on is San Francisco can be quite a lonely place if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and if you're not, if you're, you know, I think Deb and Wayne both said this, but if, if, if your tech is not hyper growth consumer facing tech, um, you're probably in the wrong spot anyway. And so you're, you're going to get a lot of no's, which is really dispiriting, um, you know, when you're, you're dragging your, you know, your increasingly sorry body, you know, around, right? You don't want to kind of hear all those no's, but those no's are not necessarily, you know, no's because your tech is no good. It's, it's no, that's not what we're looking for. And so, you know, going in with your eyes open, um, that there are various sources of funding, you know, once again, as we said, America is a big country with, you know, a lot that, that's available, I think is really important. And I wish we had understood that better when we landed. I think, you know, maybe it was my naivety, but, you know, I just 
you know, it was the valley, it was the valley, it was the valley. And, you know, um, you know, luckily what we were doing did resonate with a number of investors there and they were able to be very kind and, you know, give me time and sort of point me in the right direction. Um, but now as we are kicking, we're kicking off, you know, a series A plus round now, and um, that would be, you know, I, I'm much more open about where our funding sources come from because it's not necessarily about the milestone of being Valley funded, you know, or Silicon Valley funded. It's about the milestone of having the right investor there who can help you with the next round and help you, you know, with the next set of milestones. And so, you know, I now have a much better understanding about how to go about that. I would also say, and, you know, I think this is no news to anyone, but it's basically a full-time job. So if you are trying to grow a company, hire people, get your first customer on board, get investors, you know, you're probably doing way too much and something is not going to work for you in that, you know, variety or portfolio of things that is, is getting done. So, um, and then if you put on top of that, that you're, an, you know, kind of an expat Aussie who's probably going backwards and forwards between Australia and America and we, you know, family obligations, you know, let's be honest. I mean, you know, I, I had four children when I was doing it and, you know, it, it, that is difficult, right? It, it is hard. And I think you have to kind of go in with your eyes wide open on these things. So, you know, the question specifically to the Midwest, there are, there are great investors in the Midwest. Um, you know, actually increasingly investors are co-locating with market um, and, you know, evolving markets and evolving customer sets, um, you know, in America. And so um, if you actually just stay in San Francisco or, you know, in the Valley, you're actually cutting yourself off from a huge amount of information as well as potential sources of capital, you know, as, um, you know, as a startup coming into the States. Um, I think the, you know, I guess the other thing I was going to, um, I, I suppose, raise, um, you know, was that from, from, from our perspective, you know, as, as AgriDigital coming into the U.S., um, the, 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 the importance of forging local connections that are, that are real um, and putting the time into building relationships um, where you actually get told the truth about what is going on. If you can't afford to employ locals, you need to have some good, strong local networks that are truth-telling networks, you know, not just kind of telling you things that you might like to hear. Um, we recently employed um, our first uh, local kind of post-COVID after we'd had to change some plans during COVID at Christmas time. And it has just, whoa, what an eye-opener. Like having someone who is known in their field, um, is respected. You know, I kind of say to my founders, you know, Katrina, this wonderful person who I won't even give away her surname just in case you, someone tries to poach her. <laughs> but, you know, that's a reality as well, by the way. Um, you know, but, you know, she's like the three of us founders rolled into one. And so the ability to kind of have this trusted person who can execute on strategy as well as operationally and understands the mechanics of startup to scale up has just been incredible for us. And it's worth everything. And it's worth, you know, like if you had two or three juniors, you would never get the same impact, even if you had three times the number of people. So I think, you know, really thinking about what you can do versus what other people can do is really important as well early on. And if you have the capacity to employ someone, I think generally employing a local is a better decision. But that also requires some organisation, right? You generally have to have a corporate on the ground. It doesn't have to be the, um, you don't have to be headquartered there, but you generally need to have a corporate. You generally need to have a bank account. Um, you know, these are things that we have, frankly, found challenging. Um, I mean, getting the company set up was easy. Getting a C Corp, Delaware C Corp set up is easy. Getting a bank account, not so easy. Um, and, you know, Wayne, I've got a lot to go in front of me in terms of the things that you were talking to earlier around navigating, but even just understanding things like health insurance for employees and, and things like that is it's very, very different to Australia. Um, and it does require, and time should be set aside um, to, to deal with these matters because, you know, probably as a startup, you can't take advice from a big four accounting firm or consulting firm to, to help with that. So a lot of that is going to be done, you know, in, in your own time. Um, so it's not to be kind of take, tell people not to do it. It's just to kind of go in with the eyes wide open. Thanks, Emma. That's some really 
good insights and, and advice there. One question I'd like to ask is around um, adjustments you'd had to make during COVID. And we've only got a couple of minutes left, uh, but I just thought we'd do a quick um, moment just to, to go around and, you know, advice in the current climate um, and how you've had to adjust for, for COVID. Um, okay, well, I'll just jump in really quickly and then hand across. Thanks. So um, we, uh, a couple of things that um, you know were not great timing last year. I was in the US in at the time when COVID you know started accelerating in terms of uh, becoming clear it was going to be incredibly impactful, um, even if we weren't clear quite how how it was going to play out. But I had just kicked off a capital raise. It became clear that that was not going to be possible to execute um, you know the way that we wanted to do it. I mean, I think there was still money there and it was still mobile, but. Um, and the other thing was we were about to um, sign a lease and uh, we had a couple of locals who we had brought over. Um, so we basically had to throw the plan out and kind of begin again. Uh, and, um, you know, that has been hard, but it has meant um, that, you know, two things. One, we actually really tested the customers that we had uh, because we weren't there in market to support them. And so we now kind of know like what we can do from here and what needs to be done from the US. And so, and we could be a little bit more thoughtful around how we built the team. So I think we did learn a lot through the process. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, this kind of, you know, digital tailwind that has occurred has actually been good for our growth overall. Um, and so we're probably going to be, you know, we're just raising now and we're kind of going back into the market with probably a better set of figures, you know, than what we, what we had originally. So, but I think COVID was, disruptive for us for sure and, and it required thinking and patience and I took the decision as the CEO to repatriate all of our team back to their countries of origin and you know so they could wait things out with their families and friends and and that was disruptive to the business but was just the decision that we took. Thank you for sharing that Emma very um, yeah difficult situation. We've only got about a minute or so left at I do want to, I mean we have so many topics that we could talk about but I do want to end with a um, a piece of advice that you'd have for the founders on the line, a sentence or so um, of, you know, what you'd recommend for them as they're looking to go to the US. So the thing about the US is everything is a recognised process. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about your university education, procurement or fundraising. So understand what that process looks like before you go start, start talking to, if we just take fundraising, understanding does the company that's making the investments, do they do seed, series A, series B? At what stage do they invest? If you can qualify them out, um, you will actually be much faster at your fundraising than just trying to talk to every single fund in the Valley. Some great advice there, Deb. That's great. And Wayne, any piece of advice from you? And just go to the places where other internationals already are and they're used to dealing with international people. That'll make it easier. The second thing is leveraging the Australian network, you'll find companies like legal firms and other companies that have both Australian and North American practices and Australian and North American experts. Those people were really helpful with guiding us through a whole range of things. The third thing is most of the Australian states have trade and investment commissioners in North America. And depending on which state you're from, reach out to the trade and investment commissioner. You know, we've got uh, Vicky, from Queensland and those people are amazing. And they can also help you with little things. Like for example, we, we got to put our office in their office for a little while while we were first getting established. It was really helpful. They introduced us to the company that they used to get insurance and you know do payroll and all that kind of stuff. And so we were able to find and navigate our way through various challenges by just talking to others about what they did and getting introductions. So I'll leave that with you. Good luck. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Some fantastic practical advice there. And Emma, and a last piece of advice from you? So, the, you know, obviously we're proud Aussies and um, that's fantastic. But if you're going to the US, de aussie your website. You know, don't say it's all about Australia and only have Australian images and examples and case studies and phone numbers, you know, all those sorts of things, right? I know that sounds so simple, but don't be a visitor you know, be someone who is making a business and growing a business into the US. That fantastic um, advice for our founders. Well, thank you very much, Emma, Wayne and Deb for your time today. Um, the insights experience that you've shared with us today is absolutely fantastic. And I'm so glad that you could all be here.
to share that. I know that I'm sure that the attendees also found it as, as um, interesting and insightful that I did too. So thank you all. I'd now like to pass over to Patrick from the US Consulate, who is going to share a little bit more about immigration in the US. I just wanted to take a few minutes. Uh, I appreciate this from the Foreign Commercial Service, and uh, I really enjoyed hearing about everybody's experiences in the in the United States. But just a quick immigration update for you, since you've probably been hearing in the press about uh, what is the status of the uh, American consulates and embassies overseas. I'll tell you the three consulates in Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth are currently open for visa appointments. We do have a limited capacity due to COVID-19 restrictions, so do make sure that you make an appointment early. Uh, while you can, many of you are familiar with this, but while you can make short trips and have business meetings using ESTA and the visa waiver program, a visa will be required once your business is up and running. To find out which one is most appropriate for you, you can go to our website, which is US Travel Docs. D O C K or D O C S dot com. Again, that's US Travel Docs dot com, and there's information about the different visa classes that are available to you. Specifically, a visa class that is only available to Australian nationals, you must have an Australian passport to get this, is the E3 visa, which is a uh, part of the class of the treaty trader, investor, and entrepreneur visas. This visa class has a cap of 10,500, but it's been heavily underutilized uh, by the Australian public. In the three years that I've been here on assignment, the most that we have ever issued in one year is just a little over 6,000. So every single year, almost 4,000 of these visas are not being used by Australian entrepreneurs and those in the business community that want to expand into the United States. So it is available. It is there. There is a way for you to, to expand into the U.S. and take care of your investment there. Visa policy has not changed with regards to working visas for entrepreneurs and investors in the United States. Visas are available to uh, not only the primary investor, but also to their spouse and children who will reside with them in the United States. We do recommend the assistance of an immigration attorney, but reassure you that many applicants are able to do this entire process on their own. I just saw in the chat somebody asking for uh, re uh, restating that visa. It's called the E3 visa. You will see on ustraveldocs.com, there is information about an E1 and E2 visa. The one that is unique for Australian professionals is the E3 visa. That is the one, as I said, each year is underutilized by at least 4,000 visas. That's all I have from here. So we're coming up to the hour. So I just wanted to thank everyone for joining the call today. Wayne, Deb and Emma, you offered such different experiences and insights. Three things were clear. The U US offers a thriving culture of innovation, a productive workforce and unmatched diversity. Thank you for Joanna for doing such a fabulous job leading today's discussion. We look forward to working with you on the call as you look to expand to the US. Have a good day and a good evening. Thank you.